so yeah, so I'm going to talk about work uh, that I've been doing for the past couple of years in collaboration with various linear combinations of the following authors, uh, three of which are here at the conference, uh, Ami, Zuhair, and Liam. Um, and uh, kind of the overall setup or the overall uh, goal um, is very akin or very similar in spirit uh, to the truncated conformal space approach that we've already heard multiple nice talks about. Um, and so the basic setup we want to study is I want to start with some conformal field theory in the UV, um, and it's in some number of space-time dimensions. Um, and uh, I'm going to assume that I have all the data about this starting point, about my original uh, UV fixed point. And then what I'm going to do is deform that, deform that CFT by one or more relevant operators, breaking conformal invariance and creating some RG flow leading down to some new quantum field theory in the IR. And I want to be very agnostic about what's happening in the IR. I could have a mass gap. Um, it uh, could, the gap could close, and I could lead to a new IR fixed point. Um, but I'm especially interested in studying this system, as is basically everyone else here at this workshop, um, in the case where this theory is strongly coupled. Um, and so just working backwards in the title, um, we're going to tackle this problem via Hamiltonian truncation, uh, very much akin to the spirit of uh, the truncated conformal space approach. We're going to try and use the conformal structure of my starting UV theory to organize my truncation basis. Uh, but we're going to do a slightly different choice. We're going to choose uh, to work in light cone quantization, which I'll argue later on, uh, or I'll give you kind of our motivations for why we're uh, deciding to work in this. Um, and the goal is to use this truncation framework uh, to study the full RG flow. And so I'm going to show you some plots later on in the talk where we can actually see the full RG flow starting from the UV CFT down to the IR. And so our motivation for kind of trying to pursue an alternative or a complementary framework uh, to the more standard TCSA approach, or I guess that's redundant, TCSA, um, is uh, the kind of threefold motivation. One, we're really interested in studying dynamical observables. I really want to study things like time-dependent correlation functions, scattering amplitudes, um, things like this. So we're going to frame our uh, system directly in terms of uh, Minkowski space, and we're actually going to work in momentum space to kind of get better access to these dynamical observables. Um, relatedly, I'm very interested in studying kind of the infinite volume uh, results. I really want to study correlation functions at infinite volume. Um, and lastly, um, I'm very interested in working in higher dimensions. So there's been a lot of great work um, in TCSA and other Hamiltonian truncation methods uh, in two dimensions, and there's been some push towards getting to higher dimensions, but uh, we are pursuing this alternative, this alternative approach in the hopes that it will uh, allow us to study theories at higher dimensions. And I'll show some results today um, in 2 plus 1, in addition to work at 1 plus 1. OK, so the overall structure of the talk. Uh, first, I'll just introduce the basis. I'll tell you uh, our proposed uh, Hamiltonian truncation basis and how to formulate it and apply it to a very generic CFT in any number of dimensions. Uh, then we'll get into the details by looking at two specific applications. So right now we're in the uh, state where we're testing the method or trying to understand how it works in kind of controlled environments where we have uh, answers to compare to. Um, and so I'm going to focus on two examples, uh, both of which are just deformations of scalar field theory. So my UV theory is just going to be a free scalar field. Um, and we're going to study it in 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 1 dimensions. Uh, and then um, I'm going to talk about uh, some ideas we have uh, for how to apply this proposal to uh, gauge theories and bypass, uh, potentially bypass a lot of the um, naive difficulties associated with trying to apply truncation methods to gauge theories. And then lastly, if I have time, I'd like at the very end to just say a couple things um, about uh, subtleties that you encounter when trying to do Hamiltonian truncation in light cone quantization. Um, this is what we've been focusing on a lot for the past few months, is trying to understand this, especially in the context of deformations of large N CFTs. Um, and if I have time, I'll uh, mention a few brief things about that. But I'd also be happy to talk about this offline if people are interested. Um, OK, great. So that's the goal. So first, the basis. Um, I'm in some UV CFT, kind of the natural basis to use from the perspective of the CFT, which is uh, exactly the same in spirit as what TCSA does, is to use local operators, to use the primary operators of my conformal field theory. But I'm interested in studying dynamical observables, and so kind of a natural place to work is in momentum space as opposed to position space. So I'm going to do the dumbest thing imaginable. I'm just going to define a basis of states. 
by just taking the Fourier transform of primary operators acting on the vacuum. So this is going to be our basis. They're created by local operators, and they're identified by the following quantum numbers. First, they're identified by, well, obviously, their momentum and uh, the invariant mass. Mu squared is just defined as p squared. But then they're also identified by the eigenvalue under the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group, which is associated with the uh, um, associated primary operator. So for those of you who aren't familiar with CFT uh, structure, uh, the conformal Casimir operator can just be written very schematically in terms of the other genera the generators of the conformal group. It's eigenvalues, so states created by primary operators are eigenstates under this operator, and their eigenvalues are just set by the scaling dimension and spin of the associated operator. And really, all you have to know is just because this d squared is here, because this um, insertion of the dilatation operator squared is here, the eigenvalues just grow like the scaling dimension of the operator squared. And so for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm going to be using Casimir and dimension kind of interchangeably just because it's much easier to think often in terms of the scaling dimension. Um, but really, we're identifying these states by their conformal uh, Casimir eigenvalue. Well, it's not it's known that Casimir by itself does not suffice to classify operators in the CFT. So yeah, so there's also, there's, also, there's also spin quantum numbers as well. There's spin, global symmetry, and so why do you single out Casimir? Ah, good. So um, we're singling out the Casimir. You're absolutely right. I have additional um, uh, quantum numbers. Uh, but the reason I'm singling out Casimir is because that's going to be our truncation parameter. Um, and uh, our motivation for using this um, is, uh, comes mostly holographically, um, in the sense that states with low conformal Casimir, um, if I think in terms of the dual ADS picture, correspond to low mass states. And so our intuition for truncating in Casimir um, is that this corresponds to just the naive effective field theory in ADS. But I'm definitely not going to be assuming anything about the holographic description of my associated theory. That's just kind of the motivation in the back of our minds for why this might be a reasonable thing to do. Thank you. Sorry, I lost. What is mu? Mu is just uh, I Fourier transform. So I just have my energy and my momentum. And so I just in, mu is just p squared. So I have just the spatial components of momentum and then the energy, or I'm instead writing the Lorentz invariant observable. Uh, variable. And there is an extra label, alpha, that accounts for the rest of, I mean, this is... Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. I've suppressed all other, like, quantum numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I've only focused on the good, the good parts, um, or the relevant parts for what I'm going to say today. Okay, great. So this is the proposed basis. You can always define it at any CFT. Um, and so this is what we're going to use to construct our Hamiltonian. But it has one obvious shortcoming. The eigenvalues of the Casimir are discrete in a CFT. But we have this continuous label mu parameterizing our states. So every single primary operator doesn't just create one basis state. It actually creates a continuum of basis states. And so I need somehow to discretize this additional uh, parameter mu. And the reason I need to do that is because I want to put this on a computer and numerically diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And so I need some finite dimensional discrete basis. So there are a bunch of different ways you can do this. Um, but we're choosing, I think, what is kind of a general framework is you can define new states labeled by some discrete parameter k. Which you just get by integrating this continuum of states associated with a single primary operator. Yep. So if, if our CFT is just a free theory and O is some operator which is made out of a bunch of yeah say, scalar fields, contracted derivatives contracted in a certain way, then this is just some state in the fog space. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, and in that case, I understand it's a good state. Now, if you have a, a strongly coupled CFT and you take this sort of Fourier transform which smears over the whole Minkowski space, is it obvious that this is a good state? Because, you know, there are some locality uh, properties you know, for example, if you if you were to compute some observable in this state, like sandwich it, uh, sandwich some local operators between two states of this form, mm -hmm. then your integral would you know it would extend like twice over the whole Minkowski space, and there would be some regions of this integral which mm -hmm. are like light-like separated, space-like separated would be a mess. Yeah. Is it clear that this is a would be a well-defined integral? Is it clear? 
clearly this will be a well-defined integral. You just mean if I want to compute like the overlap of some like UV operator, some some yeah, good. What precisely are you asking? You're asking I want to look at some operator like on this basis or yeah. For example, I would like to evaluate a three-point function. I would like to evaluate a matrix element of some local operator sand sandwiched between two states of this form. Is it clear that it's going to be a, a, a finite quantity in a in a stronger coupled CFT? Uh, yes. Um. Because of causality, I mean, because I'm confused about how causality will work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Um. You're just asking, OK, great. You're just saying, I have, I have the local operator. I'm inserting like these states in yeah, the middle. Is it obvious that this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I have to do this double free transform of some non-local three-point function, which kind of extends to, which has some causal structure and so on. So, so I mean, it definitely depends. Um, also, there's some singularities on the light call. Well, there's a Whiteman prescription, and you, you perform the, perf the right Fourier transform of the Whiteman correlator. Yeah, yeah. As long as your relevant operator, that, as long as the operator that you are considering evaluating, uh, as long as its dimension is uh, bigger than d over 2, it's fine. More than d over 2. Bigger. No, bigger than, yeah. Which operator? The, the one in the middle or the one well, on in the, the other side? So in the middle. So yeah, if I want to compute a three-point function, for example, um, yeah. So what I find is that um, you can use ADS as a representation. Yeah. Of that, for but for example, for free theorists, this problem doesn't appear. So why is this? It doesn't. No, it does appear for three. Yeah, that's going to be important. Yeah, or what? Can I explain? Uh, I mean, state. I insert anything. No, I mean it's. Uh, um, no, no, no. So for example, if I if I look at yeah yeah great. Um, if I look at like say state one. And I look at like the expectation value of like phi squared. Yeah. Um, if I compute this in free field theory in two plus one dimensions, um, the integrals over the momenta of the external states. So this is some this is Fox space states like weighted by some like wave function associated with whatever local operator I've chosen, right? Like I like let's say I wanted to compute like phi squared for example. Okay. That would be some integral over two particle states in the free theory. Weighted by a flat like wave function, or if I want to look at T mu nu, it would have it would be some polynomial momenta, okay. and when I integrate over those uh, those momenta, um, it turns out that if the scaling dimension of my operator is less than d over two, which happens for phi squared um, in three D, uh, then I get IR divergences. I get divergences associated with when the momenta of the individual like partons that make this guy up uh, go to zero. And so that's actually, yeah, um, so we're jumping way ahead with this, but uh, that's actually like a really big technical problem, uh, or it at least complicates the calculation um, in 3D. We, th we understand how to work with this, but it does make the calculation more difficult. But yeah, this is definitely, you definitely do encounter these sorts of divergences. But if you're above, hmm? What about 2D? 2D, 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 it, 2D it happens for a more, so yeah, yeah, so good. So 2D, um, this can happen as well. Um, if your external states were, say, vertex operators, you find exactly the same divergences. Um, but if you look at like conserved currents, you uh, don't. And I, that has a nice like interpretation, which I guess I could just tell you now. Basically what happens is your naive basis would be built out of conserved currents and vertex operators in 2D. You find IR divergences that lift out all of the vertex operators, leaving only conserved currents as like your complete uh, basis. Um, if you add like a phi squared deformation, if you have a mass term deformation, which sort of makes sense because you think like as soon as I go away from the massless theory, I don't expect these to be independent degrees of freedom. And so these IR divergences seem to be doing something good for you. They seem to be lifting out states um, that uh, you would have thought are redundant along this IRG flow. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Thanks. Okay, yeah, no, thanks. No, no, thanks for that question. Um, I, I missed, what is GK? Oh yeah, good. So yeah, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> so great. So um, okay. So I need to discretize mu, um, and what uh, what you can do is um, you can define a discrete base of states by integrating your continuum against weight functions GK, which you can choose to be whatever you want. Um, two obvious choices that we've played with is one um, is just the set of orthogonal polynomials, uh, just a set of orthogonal polynomials built from mu. The other is you could just do like discrete like kind of step function wedges where you just say this has support over mu i to mu i plus one. The next guy has equals even support. Um, so just what some sort of wavelet basis? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you could consider multiple. Yeah. So um, 
But the important thing, the only reason I'm drawing attention to this is because um, A, you definitely need to discretize in some way. And B, when you discretize, this is kind of an obvious statement, you have to introduce some sort of scale in this. Um, you have to introduce some sort of UV cutoff, um, lambda squared. But the important thing is that this is a Lorentz invariant cutoff, which is why I was kind of writing things explicitly in terms of mu here, is that our cutoff, um, in contrast with the cutoff in, say, TCSA, um, is a simple like Lorentz invariant cutoff, so I don't have to worry about uh, like non-local counterterms arising from the presence of this uh, cutoff lambda. Um, great. Okay. So I do this. So this is the actual basis we're going to consider, is a basis of conformal Casimir eigenstates built from local operators in momentum space where I've discretized the invariant mass mu in some way. And so I naturally have two truncation parameters associated with this basis. The first is the conformal Casimir. So I have to set some maximum conformal Casimir and only keep states below this. This is our proposed truncation. Um, and then the second is Kmax. How many of these like, discretized mu states do I keep? The first, state, the first truncation parameter, Cmax, that just corresponds to how many primary operators I have in my basis. Kmax tells me kind of the resolution of each multiplet associated with a primary operator. Um, and so intuitively, this is a very physical, like nice um, uh, parameter, um, which from our holographic perspective, we expect to be a good truncation parameter. This Kmax was just an artificial discretization of mu, and so I don't expect to have good truncation in this. So generically, I expect that I don't have to set Cmax very large, or at least the convergence should be more rapid in Cmax, um, whereas Kmax, I expect the convergence to be slower. So in practice, I expect to set Kmax much larger than, than Cmax. Yeah. So you said you had to discretize mu. Oh, yeah, just because I want to hand Mathematica or whatever system I'm using to diagonalize my Hamiltonian a finite dimensional matrix at the end of the day. So that's P because you would break Lorentz invariants. Well, I'm going to work, yeah, so I'm just going to work in a particular P frame. Um, so I will fix the frame P. And so the only remaining parameter is just mu. So this all flows from a choice of wanting to work in infinite volume as well. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. No, but for example, I mean, it depends on what the dependence on mu is. If, we, if the dependence on mu was analytic of exact wave functions, mm -hmm. and analytic wave functions of mu, they, if you, if you were to choose the right basis, you could get a very fast convergence also for this k -mark. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. Uh, if, I was, if I was clever or if I somehow knew ahead of time like what an efficient basis would be for these, for these packets g, then yes, I could definitely improve. Let's say it depends not as much, but pretty much any reasonable basis works if the function is nice. If the function is not nice, then you may have to think about the basis mm -hmm. adapted to the function. Yeah. But yeah, but right now we're yeah we're being very naive about our um, implementation for these guys. We're just using very dumb either polynomials or just discretized um, like step functions uh, in mu. Okay, great. So that's the basis. Um, now we're going to do Hamiltonian truncation with it. So I started off with some CFT, which I deformed by some relevant operator. So my Hamiltonian is just the original CFT Hamiltonian which our states by construction are eigenstates of. I, they have uh, the mu, associated mu eigenvalue, or are at least easily uh, computable in terms of uh, CFT eigenstates. And then my deformation, where this deformation comes from the one or more relevant operators that I added to the theory. And so to construct the Hamiltonian, computing these matrix elements is trivial. So the only hard part is just computing, or the only thing we have to do is we have to compute the matrix elements of this um, Correction to the Hamiltonian. Was there? So just before you go, can I ask a quick question? The yeah, yeah. lambda squared that you introduced in that integral there. Yes. That is your yeah. That's your UV scale. That's how. You yes, that is a UV. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there'll be two like kind of quote unquote physical scales or mass scales that we've introduced. One is the one associated with this parameter here, and then the other is just lambda. But I want to push that much larger than whatever physical scales I actually want to study. So if I try to construct these uh, matrix elements. Um, then my deformation is just some local operator from the CFT. Uh, my external states are just defined as Fourier transforms of local operators in the CFT. So this is nothing other than just a Fourier transformed three-point function. Okay? And so in conformal field theories, three-point functions um, are very simple. They just have a nice uh, uni uh, universal kinematic structure and then OPE coefficients. 
And so this is going to just turn into some universal kinematic function determined by p and k, or equivalently mu, um, and the scaling dimensions of the associated operators, and then just some number, the OPE coefficients, um, which I'm going to assume that I have from my CFT. And so everything is phrased solely in terms of conformal field theory data. Kind of the scaling dimensions give you the basis, and the OPE coefficients give you the Hamiltonian matrix elements. OK. Up to this point, I've said nothing about quantization schemes. You can define this basis. You can apply this Hamiltonian truncation method um, in any quantization scheme. You could apply it in equal time, or you could apply it in light cone quantization. But there comes a time in every person's life where they have to decide uh, which quantization scheme to use. <laughs> and uh, so now I'm going to, so what we're going to choose to do is we're going to choose to work in light cone quantization. So we're going to define, so you define like light cone coordinates. You choose one, dire one spatial direction to be special. And you define new light cone coordinates t plus or minus x. And so the actual Hamiltonian we're going to diagonalize is going to be uh, p plus, the generator of translations in the x plus direction. Um, and I apologize to the light cone people in the uh, audience because I'm using slightly uh, different notation, but this makes more intuitive sense to me. So I have an easier time thinking in terms of this uh, lowered. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is the Hamiltonian we're actually going to diagonalize. Um, but really, I care about Lorentz invariant observables. And so really, uh, the operator I want to study is m squared, which in terms of light cone uh, generators is just this combination of p plus, the generator of kind of the light, mo light cone momentum, and then the additional transverse directions. But my states, my basis states, are already eigenstates of this p perp and this p minus. Those are just the spatial momenta. And so what we see is kind of one nice uh, nicety about light cone quantization is that diagonalizing the Hamiltonian p plus is equivalent to diagonalizing the invariant mass operator m squared. OK. Sorry, oh, yes. Square, what you called uh, p squared before? Uh, this is going to be in, in the free theory it is. Uh, in the, uh, sorry, in the undeformed theory it is. Um, but then this is going to get a correction because of this. So it's going to be m squared c of t, whose eigenvalues are mu squared, plus a correction that looks like p minus times lambda v, like in this notation. Is that, is that obvious why that's true? This is the original like mu squared for the CFT, and then this is my correction because I'm deforming the theory. OK, so we're going to work in Lycan quantization, but why are we doing this? Um, uh, we think uh, it seems that Lycon has the following kind of adv advantages. So if we think kind of more uh, big picture or more generally, um, our kind of standard framework for studying theories when we do like perturbation theory, for example, and we expand things in terms of uh, Feynman diagrams, what's the advantage of that representation? It makes Lorentz invariant manifest, but at the cost of like obfuscating unitarity. Whereas Hamiltonian truncation is much more similar to kind of like old-fashioned perturbation theory. It makes unitarity very manifest. I'm just constructing a Hermitian operator. But at the cost of obfuscating uh, Lorentz invariance. And what I mean by that very precisely is that when I compute the matrix elements of even a Lorentz invariant observable. So let's say I'm in equal time quantization, and I want to calculate the matrix elements of m squared, say, in our basis. Okay. The individual matrix elements here, like m squared 1, 1, are going to be a function of the uh, external mu's. So it's going to be a function of mu and mu prime. But it also cares about my frame. And um, obviously, the eigenvalues of the full infinite dimensional matrix don't care about this. They're obviously Lorentz invariant. But if I truncate this matrix in any way, I've screwed this up. And so if I look at the eigenvalues of uh, a truncated matrix m squared, the eigenvalues will depend on the frame that I work in for any finite truncation. Now, obviously, I expect this momentum dependence or this frame dependence to be suppressed by whatever my truncation parameter is. So I expect this, if I look at the actual eigenvalues, to get kind of uh, mu, I'll call them tilde for like the eigenvalues of the full guy. Um, so the like truncated guys to be the true eigenvalues plus some function of p that's suppressed by some power of uh, c max. So I expect in the limit that my truncation goes to infinity that this um, Lorentz or this um, frame dependence uh, goes away. But at any finite truncation, I'm always going to have this. However, light cone quantization 
avoids this problem. The matrix elements for light code quantization do not care about the frame that you're working in. And the reason for this is because, or one way of seeing this, is that you can define or you can compute the matrix elements of m squared in light cone quantization as just the infinite momentum limit of matrix elements in equal time quantization. There's a technical caveat to this, but I'm only going to talk about it at the very end if I have time. And I'd be happy to tell you. In other schemes, at least there is a possibility to check that your cave is Lorentz invariance because you can you can do the calculation in the momentum zero sector and momentum one sector, and you have to see that uh, dispersion relation is Lorentz invariant. In, in the light front, you already fixed the frame. If you screwed up somehow, if you made a mistake, if your Hamiltonian is wrong by light Lorentz invariance, you will never notice it. You will just get wrong wrong spectroscopy, and you will not even realize that Lorentz. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, to check. Suppose that you made a mistake in your calculation and your Hamiltonian is wrong, in fact. Yes, yeah, yeah. How would you notice that? How would I notice it? I mean, like, um, the only, uh, I mean, what I would do, what I would do is I would compute, how would you notice it? Um, yeah, I'm trying to understand what you, could mean you're saying you're saying you're saying what, okay if I'm understanding the question correctly you're saying that this Lorentz variation is good because I can work in different frames and I know that those different frames have different matrix elements but then I can see that I get the same answer and it's a check that you did not screw up your matrix uh, your matrix element computations and so on so I'm so just saying that sometimes it's good to have this yeah, yeah, yeah. But why can't they just compute some other quantity which has a Lorentz trans, you get the eigenvectors, compute some observable and check its Lorentz. Yeah, if, I, if, I, if what I'm worried about is Lorentz invariance, yes, I could look at the, the transformation properties of my matrix, I mean, match. Some other quantity but, from the, like, I mean, you could calculate, values. I don't know, like some, the correlation function of something with spit. And yeah, that's what I'm getting. I get the right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I could diagonalize it, take my matrix elements, and then insert them in, say, like some two-point function, of, or compute the expectation value, or, um, and study that I'm correctly reproducing the Lorentz invariance. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the matrix elements of my light cone uh, uh, operator m squared are just the limit um, as p goes to infinity of the equal time. Uh, matrix elements. So in this sense, light cone isn't that scary or that weird. It's just the infinite momentum limit um, of the equal time, and it has this nice advantage or this this nice property, at least, um, that the momentum dependence drops out. The second advantage that we have, which was uh, mentioned um, in the uh, previous talks this morning, is that um, light cone has this um, advantage, but then it seems like a disadvantage later that the vacuum is trivial. Um, and what this means, just at a dumb operational level, um, is just that uh, if I look at any Hamiltonian matrix elements that involve the creation of, like, say, particles from the vacuum. Um, so I have, say, a matrix element that would mix the vacuum with some like higher particle state. Um, these all vanish in light cone quantization. And the reason for this is very simple. It's just because of positivity of light cone momenta. The vacuum is the unique state with total p minus equal to 0. And this is a spatial momentum, which is conserved by my Hamiltonian. Um, and so there are no p minus equal 0 states for it to mix with. Um, and so the vacuum is trivial, so I don't have to worry about vacuum renormalization. And what this means is that if I look at uh, the matrix elements for m squared, um, in equal time quantization, I would get bubble diagrams which have explicit volume dependence. Whereas in light cone quantization, because I don't have this vacuum mixing, I don't have to worry about bubble diagrams arising. And so I don't get this explicit volume dependence in my Hamiltonian matrix elements. And so, kind of from this perspective of I want to study things in infinite volume, I want to make both unitarity and Lorentz invariance uh, manifest at every step in the calculation, then kind of a natural choice, or one naive choice, uh, is to work um, in Hamiltonian truncation in light cone quantization. So this is our motivation for why we're uh, working in light cone. Yep? In your equation for m squared that you wrote there in the middle, yeah. it seems like you want to the left of it. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying only p plus gets corrections here? 
Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so only only P plus gets corrections um, in the light cone. But normally, if I calculate, say, a stress tensor in an interacting theory, I see that all these operators get correct. No, 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 good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what you can see is that, um, yeah, great. So uh, the simplest way to see this um, is that, uh, like, so P minus um, is just defined like say in 2D or something like that. It's just like the integral over um, t minus minus. Um, and so this would be proportional. Say if I just added some relevant operator, I would expect this to be proportional to like eta minus minus times OR, but this is uh, 0. So I actually don't get a correction to this, for example. And you can make similar arguments for the remaining. Um, but sorry, if I change so the minuses to plus, I would still not see any correction. No, 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 no. But then, then you get plus minus um, if you want to look at p plus. Uh, because you're integrating. And so this is just the trick. Exactly. Because, I, because I've picked a direction to be special. You're right. If instead I was working at like a flat frame and integrating over that, then I would see that these things guys can get. I see. So this yeah. is already in the light column. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, OK, great. <coughs> so if you get, oh, sorry, yeah, if you get wave function renormalization, then I would expect everything to change, right? Because then I get the, not an eta minus minus, but I get the, um, Add a counter term proportional to the kinetic term in the Lagrangian, which would give non zero components. Um, non zero corrections to, to all components. Yeah, let me think about this. Um, Sorry, I have to think about this. I mean, I'm introducing, uh, when I'm, compu I'm computing the Hamiltonian, yeah, maybe we should talk about it more afterwards. Yeah. But um, at the level of the, um, I'm, just the, I'm just inserting the Hamiltonian or defining the Hamiltonian like in the UV. Um, and so maybe you're right that if I wanted to worry about like how this runs or how the entries in that run, but at the level of just, I'm inserting some matrix that's well defined in the UV and just diagonalizing it, then I don't think I have to worry about. But, but yeah, we can talk about this more after. Yes. Um, okay, great, okay, good. So now let's talk about uh, some applications. Or are there any more questions about like the general setup um, before? Okay, so first uh, we're going to work in one plus one dimensions, and so our UV CFT is just going to be free scalar field theory. Um, and then our deformations that we're going to add is just a mass term and a phi to the fourth term. So this is the full theory we're going to consider of UV, uh, UV CFT plus deformations. So what I need to do to apply our method is I need to construct a basis of, I need to construct all primary operators up to some conformal Casimir, some maximum conformal Casimir level C max. Um, when should I start, by the way? <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not. You're still uh, almost half an hour. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, great. So I need to construct all primary operators. Um, this theory is just a free field theory. And so as Slava pointed out earlier, um, these uh, basis states, uh, I can compute them in terms of the typical Fox space state. So I can define kind of like a wave function um, in momentum space associated with each state, which is just the overlap or the projection of my state onto the typical like Fox space basis. Um, and so the operators I'm going to construct um, uh, are just uh, operators built from insertions of phi. Um, and uh, naively, uh, the three building blocks I would have The three things I can build primary operators from are the two conserved currents, d minus phi and d plus phi, and then the vertex operators, e to the i alpha phi. In light cone quantization, um, these uh, right moving modes, d plus phi, are actually non-dynamical, and so I can integrate them out of the theory, leaving only these two naive building blocks. Um, but then, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, when uh, I actually compute the matrix elements um, for these vertex operators, I find that IR divergences actually lift them out of the theory. And so the only states that have overlap with kind of the finite or the low energy uh, states are just the d minus phi guys. Um, and so it's sufficient to construct my entire basis. I can completely span the Hilbert space um, just using uh, these d minus phi's. Okay? So what I need to construct is all primary operators of the form. J 
just various derivatives, d minus derivatives, uh, acting on um, multiple insertions of phi. So you didn't repeat way like separate So yeah, good. So they are they are technically they are technically in the basis um, in the sense that they're orthogonal to these guys. Um, but then because I'm adding the specific deformation of phi squared. Um, then uh, there are IR divergences um, in the matrix elements for all uh, matrix elements involving these EI alpha phi's. So if I diagonalize that matrix, I'll find that there are some divergent eigenvalues and there are some finite eigenvalues. The finite eigenvalues only, or the finite eigenstates only talk to d minus phi, and all of these guys um, are associated with divergence. And what this has, this has the interpretation of just saying that as soon as I add this m squared phi squared uh, term, um, I no longer expect. Uh, phi um, just from the equations of motion. I no longer expect this to be an independent uh, kind of degree of freedom. And so I think that uh, my intuition would be that I could describe the massive theory using only these d minus phi states. But if instead I added, say, like a sine Gordon theory or something like that, then I would have to worry about keeping these guys around. Um, but it's specific to the theory that I'm studying. Does that make sense? Or Can I follow up on this question? Because, uh, you know, I'm, wor I'm, I'm surprised about the full effect. So I know that now if I take the separators O and I take as functions f of pi, yeah. uh, these are going to be some orthogonal polynomials yes, yeah, which yeah. are going to form complete bases yeah. of orthogonal polynomials. Yeah. So I would be even surprised, you know, even leaving aside the question of the infrared divergence when you mm -hmm. sort by square. Mm -hmm. I would be even surprised that you found some other functions which, which you know you are associated with this vertex operators, which are <coughs> orthogonal to all of these f pi pi's because f of pi's form a complete orthonormal basis of functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. So, so how can you find some other functions which are which are even in, independent of those functions? Yeah, 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 good. So this is a good question. Yeah, yeah. So you're absolutely right. So if I write things, so if I write things in terms of these wave functions instead. Uh, then you're right. Like naively constructing a complete basis is just uh, constructing a complete set of polynomials, like orthogonal with respect to this measure. Um, but uh, if you compute, yeah, good. So, um, so in other words, I would say that these functions would be sufficient also for sine Gordon or for anything else because because they're complete. So they're complete basis. So we have to be a little bit, so good. I have to be a little bit careful. Um, OK, so yeah, I have to think about the representation of if, or what the representation of this would be in terms of these guys. But um, I can just make the dumb observation, the following naive observation, which is just that my basis states are just Fourier transform of operators. And so the inner product between a state created by, like, say, d minus phi and e to the i alpha phi um, is just uh, a Fourier transform of their associated two-point function. <laughs> and so this vanishes. Yeah, but, but yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a good, it's a good question. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this goes back to my question that I'm worried that the moment you take some non-trivial operator like the vertex operator, yeah. and you try to define that integral. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried that what may break down is that that integral may not make sense. So maybe the reason why ah good oh alpha oh great uh, drops out is not because of the fact that you add phi squared, but simply that the state which is associated with this vertex operator somehow makes not, doesn't make sense. Well, I don't. It's not obvious to me. OK, so good. You are right that when I try to compute, uh, this is getting very in the weeds, but when I, when I uh, try to compute um, the matrix elements for these e to the i of phi um, directly in terms of Fox space states, that their inner product is actually divergent. Okay. Um, so I have to add in some IR regulator. And then I can properly, which makes sense, right? Like, the diver like if I think of this as just an expansion in terms of phi, like each term in the series is a uh, log. And so I have to add in some R, some like uh, IR scale. And so I can properly, so I can just add in some IR scale and then properly re, like renormalize this operator, normalize its two-point function to one by getting rid of this IR scale. And it's precisely that R that I had introduced to define these states in the first place that comes back in when I compute matrix elements um, uh, involving, say, like this phi squared operator that lift them out. Um, but I don't think, I mean, maybe you would say that that's a sign that they're not well-defined, that I found IR divergences naively when defining them in the first place. But uh, naively, I would say, yeah, it's, it's not obvious to me that that's the case, um, that I do have to introduce this, this prescription to define them. But once I do that, they're well-defined states. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, OK, great. So 
Uh, I need to find combinations of these guys that correspond to primary operators, so combinations of derivatives acting on phi that are annihilated by the special conformal generators k. Um, and uh, it, this is actually equivalent to, um, as Slava just said, as finding a complete basis of symmetric orthogonal polynomials with respect to some natural Lorentz invariant measure. Um, and so this is definitely like the hard part or like the main computational <laughs> bottleneck um, in doing this sort of work is finding all primary operators or equivalently finding all symmetric uh, wave functions. Um, and uh, what we found, um, we've uh, come up with some tricks of using kind of the CFT structure of this to speed up the calculation, but still like um, if there's a place to make progress in terms of increasing the size of the basis, it's at this level of just constructing the operators. Sorry, I have a yeah. very basic question. I yes. always thought there would have been something pathological about using this as your UV CFT just because the spectrum is continuous. Like you have these vertex operators, but you say it doesn't matter because there are IR divergences and all their contributions drop out. Well, as soon as... Um, oh, you're worried if there's like some infinity over... Infinity effect to where, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean, um, naively at the level, yeah. In the massive theory, I mean, like, so yeah. In the massive theory, I know that, um, like, just because it's a free field theory. Um, I know that the Hilbert space is just spanned by like polynomials weighted by these Fox space states. So in that case, I believe that, I mean, it makes sense that these guys had to be removed. Um, I have to think, yeah, okay, that's a fair question to think about the subtlety of does it make sense to, but, um, but if I add it, yeah, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there, but I'd be happy to yeah, yeah. think about it more, but. But you could always take a minimalistic interpretation that, you know, even if the say UVCFT doesn't quite make sense, <laughs> the fact that if you have a primary operator of this form, you will get an orthogonal polynomial, this definitely makes sense. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course, so, yeah, yeah. You are allowed to use the CFT language. Yeah. yeah. Do, you get, do you get operators with zero derivatives? Uh, no, you don't have operators with zero derivatives in the sense that those are those are related to this. So. Polynomial missing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the uh, the easiest way to see this. Well, there's there's two ways to see this. One is just that um, the integration, me the like natural Lorentz invariant uh, integration measure for the light cone quantization has factors of like one over p minus. Um, in the integral. And so when you compute, uh, like let's say I choose phi squared, that'll just be a constant wave function. It'll be divergent, which is exactly the same divergence that you encountered with this guy. Um, and so you always need factors of like pi minus for every single state. So you need one um, derivative. Uh, so you're missing to, all the constant terms. So I'm missing all the constant terms in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, amusingly enough, um, <laughs> if you rephrase our problem of constructing all, or you rephrase our basis of just primary operators built from d minus phi in terms of this wave function, then the basis that we're using um, is actually identical uh, to the symmetric polynomial basis uh, that uh, Hiller and Chebysheva talked about in their uh, previous, uh, that uh, Sophia Chebysheva talked about in her previous talk. Um, so not the light front coupled cluster, but just the symmetric polynomial. It actually turns out that that's equivalent to constructing primary operators up to some uh, scaling dimension. Um, so even though we came at it from a very different perspective, uh, our basis is actually the same. Um, uh, as uh, theirs for this uh, for this example. Um, okay, great. So good. So now uh, let's say I've done this. I've constructed all primary operators up to some threshold C max or equivalently some maximum like scaling dimension delta max. Um, then I construct the Hamiltonian, which is just evaluating the three-point functions evolved with phi squared and phi to the fourth. And then I just diagonalize the resulting Hamiltonian. Now I'm going to show some slides. But you can construct many more states because of the tricks that you're using. Yes, exactly. So we're able to go to much higher delta max than um, in practice. Yeah, it appear, Yeah, it definitely. It definitely seems that just at the level, at a dumb operational level of trying to construct the basis using the fact that it's a CFT is actually a huge advantage, um, just for us because we were initially doing it. Um, just a very dumb systematic way, um, and we found that as soon as we actually used the fact that it was a CFT, uh, things got much more efficient, or we were able to do things much more efficient. Okay, great. So you construct the truncated uh, Hamiltonian, you then diagonalize it, um, and uh, you look at the resulting eigenvalues. Um, and so what I'm showing here is four plots. The y-axis for all of these is just the lowest, um, so the green lines are going to be the lowest eigenvalue of the matrix. Blue line is uh, the second lowest, and the 
Because my theory has a Z2 symmetry and I haven't broken it uh, with my phi squared or phi to the fourth, I can split the uh, Hilbert space up into an odd sector and an even sector. So green is actually the lowest odd eigenvalue, blue is the lowest even, and then uh, red is the lowest, the second lowest odd. And then on the y or the x-axis, um, I'm showing you the coupling uh, lambda um, in units of the bare mass uh, m squared. And so at lambda equals zero, all of these eigenvalues are for all four of these plots. The lowest eigenvalue is 1, the next one's 4, and the next one is uh, 9, which makes sense. This is just the 1, 2, and 3 particle thresholds. But then as I increase lambda, what I find is that all of these start to decrease. So the lowest eigenvalue starts to approach 0, the lowest even eigenvalue also does, and they all start to go down. Um, and then as I vary delta max, which is increasing the size of our basis, what I find is that for at any finite delta max, the lowest odd, the lowest even, and the second lowest odd all hit zero at different values of lambda. So for example, you can't see it in this plot, but over here you see that the first eigenvalue, the lowest odd eigenvalue hits zero first, then it's some higher value of lambda, the, second, the lowest even, and then the second lowest odd. Um, what I would expect is I know uh, that for this theory, if I tune lambda to some critical value lambda star, um, the gap should close, and this should uh, flow to a IR fixed point in the same universality class as the 2D easing model. Um, when the mass gap closes, I expect the spectrum to be continuous, and so I would expect that at the critical coupling, all three of these eigenvalues would hit zero at the same time. Um, but what we're seeing is that that doesn't happen, but that's an artifact of truncation. That's a truncation effect. And we can see that because as we increase delta max, these guys slowly start to converge upon a single point. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to determine what's the critical value of the coupling or what's the point at which all three of these guys um, hit zero. And so what I can do is I can make this plot for different values of delta max and then extrapolate to try and figure out what the delta max to infinity limit should be. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, before I do that, um, one thing you can note is that uh, Hamiltonian truncation is just a variational method. And so this lowest eigenvalue right here always places, or actually for all these eigenvalues, but this lowest eigenvalue right here places an upper bound. Um, on what the lowest energy is going to be. Um, and so I'm always placing, any time uh, my data crosses uh, zero, that's placing an upper bound on what the value of the critical coupling will be. It will always move to the left as I increase delta max. And this just has to do with the fact that um, my method is just a variational method. And so without extrapolating, we can already, with our delta max of 34, which corresponds to roughly 12,000 basis states or 12,000 primary operators, um, we can place an upper bound on the critical coupling in light cone quantization of 1.98. But then we can try and do better than this. We can extrapolate in delta max. So this is now extrapolating um, our finite delta max uh, uh, results. And we can get uh, these three plots, which at least within error bars, um, appear to be uh, hitting at the same point. Um, and by looking at just, say, the lowest eigenvalue and where it crosses 0, um, we can place an estimate for the critical coupling um, in Lycone quantization at uh, roughly 1.84. And then we can compare this uh, with other results in the literature. Um, so the only two that I'm aware of um, are, there's a really old paper from like 1987, 1988 uh, by Harinder and Frari um, using the discrete, uh, discretized Lycone quantization. Um, they get an estimate of 2.6, but there are no error bars reported, and I don't really understand what the uncertainty in this value should be. Um, but then if you look at... Uh, the work of Burkhart, Chebyshev, and Hiller, they find, uh, they estimate the critical coupling to be about 2.1. It's not surprising that this is above our value um, because uh, their basis is the same as our basis, um, but they're using a much smaller value of delta max. Um, their delta max is roughly 18, uh, but they're not truncating uniformly in different particle number sectors. But all this is to say just their basis is a subset of our basis. Um, and so we've included more states. These plots always move to the left as you add more states, so it's not that surprising that their value is close, but above, uh, slightly above uh, what we find. So how do you estimate the error? So yeah, so how we have to estimate the error is, um, this is just the error in the extrapolation. Um, so we uh, have the various points, say, for this first guy. At, for each value of lambda, I look at, say, the value of uh, the lowest eigenvalue as a function of delta max, and then I fit um, that, uh, that I, yeah, I just fit that, and uh, this is just the uncertainty um, in that fit, roughly by just, uh, oh, okay, 10, oh my god. Okay. What happened to k-max? What happened to k-max? Oh, great. Um, yes, thank you. I meant to say that. Um, so for this specific theory, because all of my states are built from left-moving modes, d minus phi, 
any operator built from these guys is going to be annihilated by p squared, or more accurately, it's annihilated by p plus. And so any operator I build has invariant mass 0. And so there is no continuous parameter to discretize, but that's very specific um, to this theory. When I go to 2 plus 1 dimensions, that won't be the case. Um, it just has to do with the fact that I have purely holomorphic uh, basis states. Yeah, but that's, there are still many theories which satisfy this requirement. Yeah, 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 that's true. In 2D, yes, there are. In 2D, any, free, any theory which is in the theory of free Yes, if I'm starting from a free theory, I will always have this. Yeah, that's true. It's the same for free fermions. Yep, absolutely. OK, great. OK, so that's just looking at the uh, mass spectrum. Now what we want to do is we want to look at dynamical observables. So we don't just have the eigenvalues. We have actual eigenstates. And so one thing we can do is we can try and look at correlation functions of local operators. Um, and so because I'm working in momentum space, kind of a natural thing to look at instead um, is the uh, spectral density the Kalman-Lehman spectral de density, or spectral representation, um, which is just the uh, decomposition of my two-point function of some local operator in terms of mass eigenstates. Um, and so this is just the equivalent of the two-point function, but just in momentum space. Um, and so uh, in practice, um, it's actually going to be simpler to compute not the spectral density, but the integrated spectral density, so the kind of cumulative um, overlap of my operator with mass eigenstates up to some threshold. And so how we compute this in practice is we just diagonalize the Hamiltonian. That gives us these mass eigenstates mu i. We just compute their overlap with whatever operator we're interested in and then sum up those overlaps up to some threshold to get the integrated spectral density. And so for example, I can look at the integrated spectral density of the trace of the stress tensor, um, which in light cone coordinates or in light cone quantization in 2D is just the component t plus minus. So what I'm plotting here is for a specific value of lambda, so I've just looked at the theory at one specific value of the coupling, I've set delta max, I've diagonalized the Hamiltonian, I've computed the overlap of t plus minus with the various eigenstates that I uh, get out when I diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And then I've just added up, uh, this is showing their cumulative overlap with t plus minus. And so the dots actually correspond to the discrete points corresponding to basis states, and the dotted line is just an interpolation to kind of see what the functional behavior is. So how much should we believe this? Because your uh, convergence gets worse and worse and worse and worse as you move up in mu, right? Uh, so great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah, show you a ton, a ton of plots uh, about convergence. So let, let me know if you're unhappy. Um, but uh, OK, so I start at lambda equals 0 in the free theory. Uh, my, so t plus minus only talks to two particle states in the free theory. So unsurprisingly, the spectral density starts at uh, 4m squared at the two particle threshold. And then as I increase the coupling, uh, what I find is that two things happen. One, the eigenvalues start to move to the left. This is just the same thing that we saw in the previous plot where the eigenvalues were starting to go to 0 as I increase the coupling. And the spectral density starts to deform from its free field theory value. And then as I keep going, what I find is that as I get near the critical coupling, as the mass eigenvalues hit 0, the spectral density of t plus minus goes to 0 um, in the IR. This is indicative that the theory I'm flowing to is a CFT, because I expect in a CFT for this trace, the trace of the stress tensor, which is exactly what I'm plotting, to vanish at a CFT. And so this is kind of a nice check, um, or a nice way of seeing that the theory we're flowing to is described by a conformal fixed point. And so you can imagine doing this in a theory where I didn't already know the answer. I could see the mass gap close. And then by looking at observables like the trace of the stress tensor, I could determine whether or not this theory corresponds to a CFT. Which, of course, I knew this a priori because I expect this point to correspond to um, the, uh, easing, the 2D easing model. OK. But it's all well and good to look at uh, this at a specific value of delta max. The question is, how does it converge, or how much should I trust uh, this data? And so what I can do is I can make a plot of the same thing, just the integrated spectral density. Here I've just done it at a particular, um, a particular coupling or a particular uh, mass gap. And then I'm going to vary uh, delta max. So I'm going to slowly increase the number of states I have. And what we see is something kind of nice. Our basis builds up the spectral density from the IR up. And so I get the most rapid convergence for even, say, delta max of 16 in the IR. I already am doing a good job of reproducing the spectral density with very few states. And this is exactly what I want. I really care about IR physics. I really want to study IR states. So this is confirming that our basis, at least for this model, um, is a useful basis. It's sufficiently reproducing the IR and then slowly moves up as I increase delta max. So have you looked at what individual matrix elements are doing? Because you're summing up lots of terms. In yeah, 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 great, great. So um, yeah, so you can, uh, yeah, you can understand this convergence. Um, 
I think I'm running it slow, a low, short on time. But yeah, you can look at matrix elements and you can understand actually the rate of convergence or what you would expect, uh, what the approximate size you expect for the error due to truncating. Yeah, absolutely. OK, great. Um, so yeah, you can zoom in, uh, look in the IR, and then you can compare to the theoretical prediction for the easing model. And you find that in the IR, it agrees with the easing model, and then it starts to deviate. And I just want to stress, this deviation is not truncation error. This deviation is because the theory I'm studying is not the easing model. It just flows to the easing model in the IR. And so this deviation right here, because the theories converged, we can see that all of the, theories, all of the results agree as I increase delta max. Um, this is just showing me the flow from phi to the fourth theory or from free field theory in the UV down to the easing model in the IR. And you can see it. it's right above scale, right around scales of order of the coupling is where I start to see deviations uh, from the easing model prediction. OK, uh, I'm going to go really quickly because I have five minutes. But um, I'll just show you one other plot. Um, well, no, I'll bypass this. Um, so you can look at uh, other operators like phi to the n. Uh, we can see that we get universal behavior because all of these Z2 even operators should flow to epsilon in the IR. So we should see that their spectral densities agree in the IR. We can again uh, zoom in, and we can see that in the IR, they all agree with the prediction, the easing model prediction for uh, epsilon. Um, and then the last thing we can look at is um, the component T minus minus, so another component of the stress tensor. Um, the integrated spectral density of uh, the component T minus minus is actually equivalent to the Zamolodzikov C function, which flows from the central charge of the UV CFT down to the CFT of the IR. Uh, down to the central charge of the IR CFT. Um, and so if I plot the spectral density of T minus minus, that can tell me that's equivalent to looking at uh, the Zamologic of C function um, along this flow. And so here I've plotted uh, the spectral density for a particular value of the coupling. And what I really like about this plot is you can see the entire IR flow. In the UV, it asymptotes towards the free scalar value of 1. And then right around the scale, um, which you uh, so right around the approximate scale of the coupling, which you would expect just from naive dimensional analysis, we start to see drastic transition away from the free value. And so this is the scale, like from, from this plot, you can just read off what the interaction scale approximately is. And then down in the IR, because this theory has a mass gap, um, this flows to just the trivial, fixed, the trivial um, central charge value of zero. Now, the obvious thing you would want to do is you would want to try to get the mass gap as close as possible to zero and see the sum leveling out, some plateau around c equals a half. You would like to read off the central charge value of the 2D easing model from this. And it turns out um, that this value right here um, is very uh, UV sensitive or equivalently um, uh, very difficult uh, to reproduce with uh, low delta max or with the delta max that we're currently at. And the reason is for the following. It's for a very dumb reason. It's because your critical coupling is not very large. And so what you need, if you want to read off the central charge value of your IRCFT, is you need a large separation between the following three scales. You have your mass gap, which is just the lowest eigenvalue. You want that to be much less than uh, the critical coupling scale. But you're limited by your IR resolution, which is roughly set Uh, by the coupling scale, the other the scale in your matrix, uh, divided by whatever your truncation scale is. And so you need M gap to be much, much less than the critical coupling to be able to read off uh, the plateau at C equals a half. Um, but you're limited at finite delta max um, because you're bounded by below. Just your IR resolution can't get low enough. And it turns out for this particular observable, um, we're actually remarkably sensitive to these corrections. And so the corrections just have to do with the fact uh, that T minus minus, like the UV operator we're using to study, um, is approximately the uh, easing model T minus minus, but then plus higher order corrections, suppressed by some effective cutoff. which is just of order of the interaction scale here. And so A, this suppression is small. And B, this operator is relatively, has relatively low scaling dimension. And so this infects our ability to easily read off um, the IR central charge. Is this your computation That's right. <laughs> That's true. Um, uh, OK, great. Um, so I'm basically uh, out of time. Um, but uh, so we're now working on 3D. Uh, so we can go to 2 plus 1 dimensions. 
Um, in two plus one dimensions, the only added complication um, is that uh, you no longer have d minus phi as your building block. You also have d perp phi. You have this additional transverse direction. Um, there's an additional subtlety associated with divergences in the mass matrix, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, but uh, we're working on constructing the basis um, uh, to try and study. And I was hoping to show plots, but we're not quite there um, for phi to the four theory in 3D. Um, but what we've done instead is we've studied um, just a large n model. So we've taken a theory with n scalar fields in the large n limit. In the large n limit, um, part, uh, interactions which mix particle number are suppressed. And so you can focus just on the low particle number sector. And so this is, uh, sorry if I'm going really fast. I just wanted to uh, say this and then wrap up. But um, uh, uh, I can look at the low particle sector and reconstruct, say, the spectral density of phi squared and compare it to the theoretical prediction, which is this uh, line in black, um, which aligns really well um, with uh, our results. And the one thing I wanted to stress is that um, this observation that processes which mix particle number are suppressed by 1 over n, this is only true in light cone quantization. There are additional matrix elements which vanish in light cone quantization but are present in equal time. So to do this calculation in equal time, would be just as hard as studying, say, the easing model or studying just phi to the fourth, sorry, just studying general phi to the fourth theory. And so one nice advantage of Lycone is that it, it makes this calculation actually much simpler to do. Um, OK, great. So uh, if I have two minutes, um, I just want to say a couple words about gauge theories, and then I'll be done. OK, so obviously. We would like to apply this to gauge theories and eventually try to study something like QCD in three plus one dimensions. So the obvious thing you would do, or just the most naive thing you would try, is to repeat this process exactly. So you would naively think that you should just start from a theory of free quarks and gluons. And then gauge the global symmetry by your deformation would just uh, couple these two things together. You would be adding like an a dot j term, basically. And then the idea would be then you could study the flow down uh, to QCD or just some confining theory. However, this is very difficult, as we all know. Uh, why is this difficult, though? Like, what really is going on? The reason why this is difficult is super easy to understand. The deformation that you've added is not a local gauge invariant operator. Your Hamiltonian, like, if you had infinite uh, calculation ability. The full Hamiltonian would be gauge invariant, but that's only from in integrating uh, this, a this local operator across all of space. But if you put in any sort of regulator, you're no longer integrating over all of space, and you've broken gauge invariance, unless you can be very clever in choosing your regulator. So this is why things, this, I mean, this in a nutshell is why gauge theory is difficult. Um, but what you could do instead is you could try to bypass all of this difficulty by instead starting from, say, an interacting fixed point. So let's say that I had some data on, say, some banks x fixed point. So to be very concrete, let's say I was looking at an SU3 gauge theory in four dimensions with 16 flavors. That has a relatively low value of alpha star. Alpha star is something like 0.01 something. Um, 0 0.04. 0 0.04. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 0 0.04. Um, and uh, so I can imagine potentially trying to compute this data perturbatively, at least to leading or out of, uh, order in alpha. And then the deformation I would add would be a mass term to all but, say, three of the flavors, or all of the flavors if I just wanted to study uh, pure Yang Mills. But I want to study QCD. So I'm going to give a mass to all but three of the flavors. This, A, also flows to QCD, so long as my starting point is sufficiently weakly coupled that I have a separation of scales. But the operator that I've added is a local gauge invariant operator. And so I can put a hard cutoff in here. And I can treat this system exactly the same as all of the scalar field theory examples that I've shown you right here. And so instead of, um, instead of trying to mess with choosing a proper regulator and worrying about gauge invariance, I can just close my eyes to all of gauge invariance, think as a CFT person, and start from this interacting fixed point instead. Now, obviously, <laughs> this requires me to have data at an interacting fixed point. Um, but as a, to, get my, to get our feet wet, we could imagine trying to do this for large end gauge theories. So doing this in systems where I have a 1 over n expansion or where I have uh, some data to start with, um, to where then I could try to start studying things like pure Yang Mills at large n and eventually work my way towards doing some more realistic theories. Um, OK, great. Thank you very much for your time. So we are a bit out of time, so maybe there's time for a one urgent question. And then postpone. Uh, Very urgent. You are the organizer. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay.
I have two urgent questions. <laughs> Uh, the first question is that uh, you probably, I mean, very nice calculations and you're sitting probably on a treasure tro trove of data and so on. So using what you computed, can you convince us, uh, not by, uh, by some argument, but, but, but some concrete data, that truncating, truncating in CMAX, truncating in Casimir is mm -hmm. the right thing to do, as opposed to other truncations that one can imagine? For example, I, Sorry. Could, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I could imagine that, suppose that I believe that somehow <coughs> two particle states, yeah. Yeah, independently of what their Casimir range is going to be, yeah. are more important than four particle states. Yeah. Four particle states. Like, yeah. Can you refute this expectation based on the weights of various Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you probably know. So, yeah, so good. So, if what I want to, yeah, so if all I want to know in life is just like uh, the lowest energy state, so let's say I just, want, I just cared about the mass gap, for this like specific example of like phi to the fourth theory, um, then you can see that um, at least uh, away from the critical coupling, um, for most of this plot, um, then uh, you can see that there is some semblance in which particle number is. Now it's hard to disentangle because Casimir also is suppressing. I mean, Casimir grows with particle number, but roughly it seems like particle number seems like an all right organizing principle. But as soon as you go to the higher states, if you want to go to like slightly higher and you want to get the full spectral density flow then you can see that these states do have actually significant overlap with higher particle states. And that truncating in particle number does not do a good job. Um, if you just artificially tie your hands, or not tie your hands, but just choose a different scheme and you just say, okay, I'm going to really focus on just like low particle number guys and keep those to very high degree and only supplement them with a small amount. Um, now, obviously, but then, um, uh, yeah, good. So experimentally, you can see this. I guess, yeah, sorry, I don't have any plot to show you, but... Um, um, but in looking at the weight, um, it does seem suggestive uh, that Casimir is at least a slightly a better organizing principle for these excited states as opposed to just particle number. Um, now it could be that there's some better, that there's more structure to understand. Um, it also could be that this theory is very special. Um, but, uh, but it does seem just from the data um, that Casimir is a, suffi like a sufficiently uh, um, efficient uh, organizing principle. Um, but yeah, I totally agree that it'd be worth understanding this more slash exploring it in more theories to understand more robustly how this behaves. I thought also you, you guys said for 2D QCD, you compared the Casimir cutoff versus particle cutoff that, that other true. groups had done. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There was previous work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In 2D QCD, it is absolutely true that, you know, for the lowest, even for the lowest state, you can see that uh, the lowest two operators of the same dimension, one of which is a two-particle and the other one is a four-particle, basically contribute equally. And only the, the four-particle contribution only disappears at large end. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, for sure, but, but maybe we can uh, yeah, continue during the coffee break yeah, and, and we'll see you much more. Okay, thank you.